it's great to be back with you. Look forward to uh, learning with you today. Um, we're going to start, uh, as we often do, with, uh, with an exercise. And then there'll be some, the uh, presentation and, and some time for discussion. And then there'll be a final exercise before we close out. I want you to take a moment to have a look at the painting before you. It's by the uh, German Romantic painter, Caspar David Friedrich, active during the 19th century. Uh, title is The Hiker Above the Sea of Fog, and it dates from circa 1817. But it's very conducive to thinking about the enriching art of contemplation, our presentation today. The hiker has gone up, high up. They've made the effort, and they've risen above the, the fog below that's clearing, and they're getting that, that more expansive and clearer view. This is what happens uh, in an analogous way when we contemplate and meditate. Register this image well, and then I'll guide you through an exercise on contemplation and meditation. So make sure that uh, you're seated in a comfortable place. If you're in a chair, spine upright. It's valuable to have that upper diaphragm free for uh, rhythmic breathing, un impeded. And just take some few deep breaths. At this point, you may wish to close your eyes. I suggest you have uh, your hands in your laps, palms down, feet flat on the floor, feeling well grounded with the earth. And just getting reacquainted with the temple of the body microcosm of the great macrocosm. Enjoy the rhythmic breath in harmony with all the rhythms of the cosmos. Breathing is a surprisingly simple act, but it's a rejuvenating one, especially on the exhalation there's the relaxation response through the vagus nerve. Now, the first part of our mystical exercise is going to be on contemplation. So at this point, I invite you to contemplate or reflect on something. Go with what's uppermost in your mind. It could be anything. If you wish, you may wish to open your eyes and have a look around your room. There may be something there that strikes you that you haven't noticed for a long time. And you'll want to look at it and reflect on it, why it's there and what it means to you. Or maybe you want to look out your window and see a tree, and see the wonderful way it branches and appreciate nature new. Or maybe there's something someone said to you earlier today that struck you and you haven't had a chance to fully absorb its deeper meaning and your particularly your response to it. Go with that if that's what's uppermost in your mind. Or there may be something else that you feel is pressing. Don't let the outer mind so much to it. Let it be suggested more by the deeper part of the inner mind what to go go with. It's our true guide through life. So take some time now to quietly reflect. Reflection is a very flowing activity. Just let it unfold. If you wish to switch to something else partway through to concentrate on, go ahead. Reflecting is different from just thinking about something. It involves thinking, yes, but in a deeper way and also deeper feeling.
there's a deep satisfaction in reflection. You get to see things in a new light or in a refreshing light or a way that we've always known, but it hasn't been so much brought out to our outer nature. Just let the reflection flow. Stand back like an observing self, like the hiker above the sea of fog. Observe and appreciate. Just let the experience flow. Let the inner nature come forward more. We're moving more to a borderline state so the inner self could communicate with the outer self. Now I invite you when you're ready, we're gonna go even deeper within moving from the practice of contemplation to that of meditation. And in this meditation, you may wish to simply concentrate on your breath again, the inhalation and the exhalation and the rhythm of the temple of the body in the temple of the cosmos. Let the outer nature be stilled by the concentration on the breath as we move deeper and deeper within. Be fully in the sanctuary of the master within, the deepest place of wisdom that connects us with the divine. Let the experience flow 
enjoy it in joy. Whatever you were contemplating or reflecting on has been released into the subconscious, to the cosmic mind for further understanding and comprehension to come back to us later. If you wish, you can keep concentrating on your breath. Or if you feel that's taking care of itself well. If you wish to picture your mind expanding beyond your immediate surroundings, taking in your state or province, Picture mind expanding beyond the country where you are, beyond the continent and the hemisphere where you are. Beyond the earth itself, beyond the sun and the solar system, mind expanding continually beyond our great home in the Milky Way galaxy, the great spiraling galaxy. And picture the mind encompassing the entirety of the cosmos, being one with the cosmic mind, being the cosmic mind, assuming the cosmic mind now Let us dwell here in silence and stillness. Sense the great joy and peace in being cosmic mind in which all is known and all are loved. Now soon, fratters and soars and participants will formally close our period of contemplation and meditation. But with the deep assurance, this cosmic attunement will continue to help guide us, serve us in our mission and lives. And when you're ready, very gently and lovingly, bring your concentration back more to the temple of the body in balanced state, 
the objective mind, the subjective mind, the subconscious mind, and the overarching cosmic mind, which is in all these things. And when you're ready, you may wish to open your eyes and say with me, may the God of my heart sanctify this attunement of self with the cosmic. As Rose Cushion say, so be it in truth, or equivalently, so mote it be. And we wish to stretch now, and we'll begin further our work and worship of the day with the presentation. on the enriching art of contemplation. Okay, thank you. You know, meditation done in conjunction with co contemplation is a powerful combination for allowing intuition to be recognized, heard, and acted upon in guiding our daily lives. Intuition is the expression of the divine mind within us. This cosmic attunement provides us with clear and certain insights that draws us into our full maturity as a human being, the microcosm. You know, as we've been discussing in these Department of Instruction teleconferences, meditation, which is the central practice for spirituality and masterful living. We're gonna particularly emphasize contemplation today, but they both go together. One needs to be done with the other. We will then explore methods of contemplation and reflection that place us in a borderline state between our inner and outer selves. This practice greatly augments and fulfills the insights of meditation and engenders the experience of harmony in our lives. These meditative and contemplative activities are needed for and are to be balanced with the many enriching activities and required duties of our daily lives. During the course of our day, intuition and conscience are thereby encouraged and heeded in guiding our actions and lines of service for the well being of all. I want to show you now another slide that's based on the Rosicrucian schematic diagram of mental processes, which I think some of you have seen in a similar form in your studies. It's a very important diagram. You see it in a more elaborate way in your studies and part of the benefit of your studies. Uh, if you've taken up the Rosicrucian studies already. And it's a good one to keep in mind daily because it explains so much of what's going on in our lives in a way we can think of it as a map of our mental experience. However, bear in mind that the map is not the territory. As mystical students, we need, need to take these things on as lived experiences. These are real vital living realities, but they help the outer mind and our reasoning understand. You know, in contemplation, if I point here, we're letting go of the external world of the senses unless we're particularly contemplating a work of art or something in nature or something in our room we particularly like to focus on. Even if we're doing that though, we're moving back towards the subconscious, subjective consciousness or the subjective mind where reasoning takes place because uh, contemplation and reflection have a degree of reasoning on it, but also we, we move in a, a way, keep active with that, but we move deeper, starting more into a borderline state that is partly into the subconscious and at times in contemplation, even into the, into, the, into the deeper beyond that, more fully into the cosmic conscious state. If we go even more deeply into in the cosmic mind or the 
cosmic conscious state, we've moved into the meditative state. So sometimes we may in contemplation even move into the meditative state, even when we're not con uh, specifically doing it, intending to do that at that time. That's why there's a flowing nature in contemplation and meditation. But it's often good to have a period of contemplation before we meditate or after uh, we meditate. I'll describe later some good times to do contemplation as well. But keep this diagram in mind in a way. We're moving more and more inwardly, back, even back to this, into the subconscious mind, into degree, into the cosmic mind when we contemplate. We go even deeper in when we do the, the meditative state. You'll see this in various spiritual traditions of the world. For example, in uh, uh, Buddhism, commonly uh, an aid for contemplation and meditation is the mandala, often with the four Buddhas in the four directions and the central Buddha in the center. And as we move, one moves, meditator and contemplator moves deeper, they move with through those four directions of the Buddhas into the center. We do that in meditation as well. An example in the West is the uh, brilliant student of Hugh of St. Victor during the 12th century, Richard of St. Victor, who wrote extensively on the practice of contemplation and meditation using uh, a deep symbolism of the tabernacle of Moses. As you move from the outer precinct of the tabernacle into the various parts of the room, rooms within the tabernacle, you move, Hugh, as Hugh was instructed by Rich, his master Hugh, but also Richard discussed how you're moving deeper and deeper into the different eyes of the human being, or these different phases of consciousness, human being, into the contemplative state, finally into the holy of holies, where one is deeply into the meditative state in the cosmic attunement. You know, another way to look at these matters is by another inspiring work of art uh, that's done by the artist Blake de Bassetti. It's entitled Reflection. In fact, it's on the theme of contemplation. Now, Blake is an Anishinaabek or Ojibwe artist on the sacred island of Manitoulin or Manitoulin Island in Ontario, Canada. Is an acrylic on oil painted in 1981. One of the very striking things about this work of art is that it shows a person uh, lying down in a field of flowers and they have their hands over their chest. We know that resonates very deeply with this because it's a ch connecting with the psychic heart. You notice the lines of energy. It's often in this woodland style of art of the psychic force and spiritual force that's in the person. The flowers are beautifully arrayed around it. Person's deep in contemplation. You notice by the nape of the neck that there's a beautiful eightfold flower at that very important spiritual center, uh, the great nexus of the nerves in the body that are important in meditation. Blake's note that he left on the back of this, can this canvas is that, and I read to you, sometimes a person must find times for themselves to look inside of themselves. You search for that silence you need. We're all searching for the truth and balance. Now, when we contemplate and meditate, when the fruits of our meditation, symbols may arise spontaneously, often associated with the work of arts we've looked and can have inspired these artists to do these wonderful works. And we find that symbols may spontaneously arise from our everyday activities to help clothe impressions so that they are intelligible to the outer and subjective consciousness. For example, while we're walking over a bridge, bridge can have a profound meaning in our life, or while we're ascending an elevator. We can even use those experiences to consciously help us attune with the cosmic. Now intuitive impressions make a journey. Now think of that uh, schematic diagram of mental processes. Intuitive processes make a journey through the phases of consciousness. 
sometimes in one flash or sometimes in successive percolations from the inner consciousness to our outer consciousness. On some occasions, we may even realize that a deep insight impressed on our outer conscious first made its way to our inner consciousness during meditation earlier in the day, and hence the great value of being regular in doing meditation. Now meditation done in conjunction with contemplation is a powerful combination for allowing intuition to be recognized, heard and acted upon in guiding our lives daily. You see our true guide is our inner, our inner nature, not the outer nature. The outer, that's not the job, the outer nature. The job of the outer nature is to work with the inner nature then all will be ennobled and enriched. Together, this inner and outer nature, which is truly one unity. However, I'll apply the law of duality because it helps us our outer mind understand. But ultimately we use the law of duality to invoke the law of unity, to experience our lives as one. The cosmic mind is one throughout all our cells of our body, through all our reasoning then we full of fully grown up, we're fully matured. So together, there's a synergistic effect. And this can be contemplated by other practices we learn in the Rosicrucian studies, such as visualization and the use of the will to act on our received impressions. That's very important to follow through. That keeps the impressions coming. We have to be justified to receive these impressions to apply them in service and to healing of ourselves and others. Throughout the process, our capacity to concentrate is key. And we can concentrate best when we can relax. And that's where the practice of regular contemplation and meditation will assist us to be relaxed through our, our life, and daily experiences, and then we can concentrate better. Even when we have to do physically demanding things, I think you'll find that the greatest exertion will happen when there's a degree of concentration and calmness. So we can be one pointed in our action. Now, I've mentioned already that contemplation could be looked upon as putting ourselves in a borderline state. And this practice greatly augments and fulfills insights that we've had from meditation in a way it will supercharge our meditations. And it engenders what Rosicrucians call Harmonium, it's a very beautiful term from the Rosicrucian glossary about harmony on all levels of our being. These meditative and contemplative activities are needed for and are to be balanced with the many enriching activities required for discharging our daily duties. During the course of our day, intuition and conscience are thereby encouraged and heeding and guiding us for the well-being of all. Now, contemplation is an ancient exercise that assists us in understanding and affecting needed change in oneself and in society. There's great value and efficiency in taking time in our daily routine or schedule to quietly reflect. This is a surprisingly simple act and a very powerful one. Thus, essentially, we'll be reviewing the practice of, taught by the Rosicrucians of contemplation. Later, Sora Karen is going to post some resources for you. In addition to the monographs, which you may be studying, there's some books by Dr. H. Spencer Lewis and uh, Ralph M. Lewis, past imperators of the Rosicrucian order that deal with this topic. However, there may be a few new perspectives that we haven't considered before today. <clears throat> you know, just as we see our physical selves reflected in a mirror, we need to be able to observe our psychological selves so that we can stand back and determine what needs to be changed or emphasized for more healthy living and less suffering and pain. We need to gather that ability to be able to look at our thoughts somewhat like clouds going by in the sky, except the sky is the screen of our consciousness. 
not only when we do meditation and contemplation, but when these activities continue or flood through in the rest of our day, when various challenges come up, we have a choice in how much we want to get emotionally involved with them or how do we wish to direct our emotions more. You know, have you ever had the opportunity to be alone in a quiet place? And an opportunity to look over many things that you were doing in your life or you're absorbed in some important matter? Did you find that many helpful and clarifying thoughts arose in your mind? This can be a profoundly satisfying experience. Notably, this pro process is generally different from talking with friends, daydreaming, or thinking very objectively about it through the, the um, subjective mind with its deductive and inductive, deductive and inductive reasoning issue somewhat differently. It's true when we speak with our friends, especially if they're very heartfelt conversation, it can be a, a reflective quality to it. There is partly a contemplative activity, but typically I think you'll find that you can go into contemplation even more when you're doing it more uh, physically alone, or at least you can feel that way. Because when we speak with friends, we tend to be moving towards the objective state repeatedly as we look at them and think about how we're speaking with them and then back into the contemplative state. Often for that reason, we'll find that we appreciate our, mo our friends and things most deeply when we're alone contemplating. <clears throat> now there's common expressions that relate to taking time to reflect or contemplate in one's life. For example, the expression, one can't see the forest for the trees. In other words, one may be duly caught up in little pressing problems or sidetracked in other pursuits that the original overriding goal is no longer guiding one's actions. Taking time to reflect daily helps to ensure that the larger goals in our lives are worthwhile and that these goals are active in guiding us daily. Now we see the practice of withdrawal from activities for solitude and reflection in many cultures and in many epochs. This was part of the purpose of the cloister and some chapels that adjoin many of the great abbeys and cathedrals of Europe. The mountain is a recurrent motif and in part a symbol of contemplation. In the Jewish and Christian traditions is related, for example, in Moses and Jesus or the Yeshua going up the mount. And First Nations or native peoples have numerous practices of individuals going on retreat for gaining wisdom and purpose in life, including going up a high hill or mountain. It's notable that the word contemplate partly comes to and relates to the Latin word templum, which means a sacred demarcated precinct. So in a way, when we contemplate and meditate, we're forming within ourselves a sanctuary or a sacred precinct that we can come back to whenever we wish and have it as a mental habit. Now, Temples and traditional practice associated with them suggest the need to temporarily and with regularly withdraw from our active lives. The contemplative activity allows us to reflect on the deeper purposes and issues involved in our experiences. Reflection or contemplation on the events of our lives takes us deeply into ourselves. It is an activity that can and needs to be balanced with the many activities in our daily living. After a busy day of work or activities, it can be an excellent time for reflection. There are many, many events and encounters over the day. We can go with what is up, other uppermost in the mind. There does not have to be a set schedule or agenda of points to of, on issue to ponder. A meaningful flow of issues can unfold from within. Possibly there was something a person said that struck us, but we did not have sufficient time to absorb it. We may wish to stand back like a third party or observe, observer to review our behavior. That's often important to look at our, our response and our behavior, what we have the most control of. To review our behavior and another person's behavior in our meeting earlier in the day. Also, it helps 
to quietly reflect, recall and reflect inwardly on emotions that were welling up. Those are often our great keys for deeper understanding during those encounters. Alternatively, we may wish to contemplate a world issue or some social issue or an event in history, a metaphysical concept or a dream from within, dream from within from the night before we wish to ponder. You know, we regularly get emails from our class master instructors, you know, that to um, each week spend an hour on our monographs and our sanctums and to contemplate on what we've learned in the ensuing week. This practice of contemplation will help us do that very matter. Now, <clears throat> you may say there's various practical ways to do it. It can be part of when you sit down in your sanctum, but you can also build it in when you're uh, sitting or walking in a quiet place where one is physically alone, assist contemplation. You're withdrawing from the physical senses to a fair degree generally. The place actually does not have to be quiet or a private place, as long as we can reflect in an undisturbed way. With determination, a suitable place can be found, whether we're at home, at work, or traveling. Yes, build these things in to whatever you're doing daily. Now it's done best as a daily practice, allowing at least 10 minutes each day. It can also be complemented with other activities such as letter writing, walking a dog, or waiting in a lineup. Yes, we're very practical. The occasional planned retreat is very beneficial and the Rosicrucian order among its many services to its uh, members provides opportunity for such retreats for study and contemplation. Now, it's true reflection requires discipline. There may be the temptation to streak, seek distraction. And a lot of our everyday life is sort of set up for distraction. Attend to me, attend to me, you need me. And so we may need to turn off the radio or television or checking for text messages or surfing the web or similar temporarily. Those, have, those are important activities done with discipline uh, rather than withdrawing for the contemplation. However, we consider the value of the contemplative activity that will provide its impetus to provide, especially if we've had the taste of how it's helped resolve important issues in our life or the deep richness and experience and the deep sense of well being it gives. Now, a notebook is helpful. The written expression can help make what was more subtle, solid, and powerful to the outer mind. The review of such a notebook or contemplation journal at a later date, especially during a challenging time, can help realign us to the essential and living. <clears throat> in fact, the uh, psychologist in Ottawa, the capital of Canada, Wilson Van Dusen, I'm gonna give you a reference uh, for a book he wrote and very insightfully on uh, contemplation and similar spiritual activities. He mentioned about, and very strongly emphasized, write it down. He said, if you do that daily, you have a journal to do that, you will become a great contemplative. And he was not exaggerating. That's why it's often, so we're so strongly stressed for us in our teachings of the order. Have that journal for what you're learning in the monographs and how those things are informing and taking place in your life. Now, you know, contemplation is a very meaningful activity and it's profoundly enjoyable in a way that the passing thrills and fads of the day cannot even approach. You know, during reflection, one can often experience the maturing process taking place within one's own being. You know, often we think about maturing and growing up, it's a very gradual process, that's true. But when we go deeper into contemplation, there's times where that it will actually experience that maturing taking place. It'll circulate around the physical heart, then the psychic heart. It's a wonderful uh, experience to have. And you feel your, your mind being uh, rejuvenated. The Rosicrucians have a very beautiful expression, peace profound, or the most profound peace that one can experience. When we experience that in its fullness, 
we are in the state of contemplation and contemplating regularly will make it a more regular experience in our lives. And when we wish that to others, we'll actually evoke that experience even more in ourselves and how we pass it on to others. Now the process of contemplation is a very flowing activity. It involves both thinking and feeling combined. It, it may, it at times may seem as if a greater mind is inspiring us in a most helpful way. This is the experience of coming in contact with the full depths and connect, connections we have as a human being with the God within the divine within or the master within, which is we are actually one with and who we are truly are. Sometimes if we're not ex used to that experience, it can seem like it's some other greater being coming to us, but that is actually fundamentally us speaking to ourselves, being one with the cosmic mind, who we truly are. That's why often these experiences can surprising to the outer nature, outer nature, but there's a deep familiarity because we're already there in actuality. It's just a matter of realizing it in reality. Now, you know, the practice of meditation and contemplation can provide upliftment and profound understanding of important questions in which we're seeking answers. Maybe ones we've sought answers for, for a long time and maybe even didn't think could be answered. Or maybe something pressing that's important in family matters or an important life decision we made that the finite and limited resources the outer mind can't get. Can't look it up in an encyclopedia, can't look it up on the web. Maybe there's some helpful pieces of the puzzle there, but the infinite resources of the cosmic mind the master within practice of contemplation and meditation will make those things come forward to us in understanding. Um, now, meditation and contemplation are also complemented by various practices we learn as Rosicrucians, practice of analysis and then visualization and the, and the will to act on and receive impressions. This way, contemplation and meditation are among the important practical tools for masterful living that the student is brought into thorough understanding of through the greatly comprehensive system of the Rosicrucian studies. You know, it may be asked, where's, where's the time in, in today's busy world to, uh, to uh, contemplate and meditate? Well, I know I've mentioned to you on occasion, well, if you meditate for an hour a day, I think you'll find that you have to sleep about an hour or less. There's one answer, but make sure you're getting lots of, lots of good sleep as well. But uh, that's something to keep in mind. You know, it also can be thought in mind if we don't contemplate, our body and nature will, will arrange for us to have time to contemplate. Often people will find when they get ill, that lo and behold, they have a great chance to do a life review because they can't get up and they're on their back. And often it's not surprising. I think you may know I say that, you know, that was a challenging experience that I went through in terms of an ailment or so forth. But in a way, it was great because I got to reflect. I overdid it. You know, there's a uh, uh, many physicians. I was talking to uh, Sora Lynn Prun, who's with us today, and she knows these things well and is part of her mission in life. There's so much wisdom in the body, and we have to work for this unified stand of health. That health means to be whole. And there's a very insightful medical doctor named Gabor Mote, who's in Vancouver, BC, and he's written various books. So I'll give you a reference to one. Um, he talks about, you know, um, if we overdo it in our lives, the body will say no, and we will become ill. And that's part of the wisdom of the body to get us to slow up, to balance. There's often we have hidden stress in our lives, and this often will lead to common ailments. There's a lot of peer reviewed medical research on this. Um, somewhere around the de decades has been gradually making its way uh, more into general practice in medicine and will help transform it. But um, you need to do, we need to do uh, contemplation. Also, our life can start to become somewhat like a broken record um, or we're a bit like, you know, the, the mouse on the wheel going around and around. You have to get some exercise. We're not really getting anywhere if we particularly want to. We'll find that our life is much more efficient in what we do if we take time to meditate and contemplate. If you've got a major task to do, um, do some meditation and contemplation, then do it get into a challenge, you're stuck on it, do some meditation and contemplation, go back to it. Uh, you'll find that it was worth the time 
was more efficient and the product is better. You know, uh, uh, there's a story of the Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens about Ebenezer Scrooge. And you, you look there, there is an example in an artistic way, what happens to a person if they don't contemplate. Uh, Ebenezer Scrooge, he was very hurt as a young man and a young boy. You know, his father in some ways had rejected him because um, the, his mother, the, his father's wife, partner had passed on at childbirth, a little more common thing that was back in earlier times, back in the 19th century and earlier. And his father hadn't really forgiven him for that. And that was very hard and led to Ebenezer to sort of withdraw from life and not be so connected with persons. And he threw himself into business and developed his business skills tremendously. But he paid a severe price. He was miserable. And his life was largely meaningless. And in a symbolic way, he had a chance to contemplate his life by the three figures that came to him in the night on Christmas Eve. And in fact, they were taken him on a trip of contemplation to stand back and look at different phases of his life and look at the repercussions of his actions on others. That's very important. Part of the value of contemplation is that we, if there's any habits of the subconscious, maybe some that we took on from suggestions from our parents, we don't be the we be the last generation that that habit that isn't harmonious gets passed on. The good habits, yes, pass them on um, as those habits in the subconscious. So Ebenezer Scrooge realized these things that he had done and he made an about face. And, you know, he said, I don't deserve to be this happy. And he said to his, his uh, clerk of Cratchit, you know, that, you know, Bob, um, I haven't lost my senses, I've come to them. And when he speaks uh, uh, to his uh, nephew's partner about, can you forgive a pig headed old fool? And then he goes on to quote the words of the master Yeheshua, whose words are much more deeply understandable when we meditate and uh, contemplate daily, that uh, can you forgive a pig headed old fool who had no eyes to see, no ears to hear all these years. And then he went on to use all that business acronym to make, as, a, as his partner had said to him, Jacob Morley, that human, that if we were good men of business, it was actually, what that means is humankind was our business. Use all that business acumen for the welfare of others. So you see, there's so much that lies for our attention that is fad that will not nourish. You know, sophistication and specialized knowledge and technical matters needs to be tempered by, guided by a higher divine purpose. The essentials of living have not changed over the millennia, living in harmony with others in nature, and discovering the laws and principles of living, and implying them for the well being of all, taking time to reflect on our lives is part of this process. We could have some time now to have some discussion and then we'll have our final closing exercise. If there's something uh, uh, anyone would like to uh, come forward and uh, speak verbally on, or if you wanna post uh, comment or a question in the chat. We'll try to get to at least to a few of the things. And and uh, I noticed Sora Karen has kindly uh, posted in the uh, the group chat uh, the resources that you can uh, you can save for the presentation if you want to do more review on this matter. Thank you. Uh, I would oh. I would like to get a better understanding of the difference between contemplation and meditation. I, I think I missed some of what you okay. said at the beginning. Okay. Okay. Very good. What basic is that you're moving more deeply in that spectrum of consciousness. It's all cosmic mind, cosmic consciousness, but you're moving as you move, uh, as you move more and more deeper into that borderline state, you move to the meditative state where that cosmic accumulation takes place. In the, in the contemplative state, you're in that borderline state between your inner and outer natures. 
in the contemplative state, you're still working with your uh, capacity to, to reason and to very feel things. But in the meditative state, you're generally letting that go and just concentrating on the breath or dwelling in stillness. With the and when you when you where there's a distraction, you bring yourself back and you do the meditation to concentrate on the breath. When contemplation, you go with the flow. You go with what others uppermost in your mind and you go with the flow of those thoughts. But that will tend to take you deeper into yourself. So that's a distinction between the meditation and the contemplation. With the contemplation, you're going with a flow of thought deeper and deeper. But with meditation, you just let that go and dwell in the stillness. There may be inspiring impressions come forward that you review and reflect after the period of meditation, but you just concentrate on dwelling in the stillness. The meditation is a deeper state of consciousness, even more into the cosmic mind, in other words, but they're both important. And what contemplation will do, it'll help impressions that may have started to come to you while you were meditating, but didn't fully make them way up to the outer, more to the outer mind. Contemplation will help draw those out. And it'll supercharge the value of the meditation for you. Thank you. He's asked about Pamela about his contemplation book. No, no, what's, the, what's the difference between, between contemplation? Yeah, it's along those lines I'm mentioning. You're flowing with thought and contemplation deep in a borderline state. You're, you can have your eyes open or closed, but you're letting go of outer impressions. In meditation, we go deeply into that cosmic attunement. So you can have an you can have in your mind a period of contemplation and then they go into meditation. But it's good to do both. It's good to be doing both, but take time for each. And you can build, you know, sometimes I do contemplation on washing the dishes. You know, you can do, you can have the formal period, but you can also use various times that you're working on duties to do the contemplation as well. Mr. Hughes. Yes. Um, does this entire, can you entire and uh, like, tie this together with manifestation? Yes, a great okay. question. Because you want to be, you want to have probably the various Rosicrucian practices because okay. you know, if you've got a problem or something that you want to deal with, get write it down on paper or have it objectively expressed. Let the outer, you know, work with your subjective consciousness. Use the deductive reasoning, use the inductive reasoning, but then have a period and then look, you know, if there's any resources on the web or encyclopedias, whatever, you can consult with someone, use yes, those, sir. use those, but then, then have a period of contemplation to let it start to incubate deeper within oneself on that. And then have a period of meditation to go even deeper on it. I think you'll find that deep impressions will come up in meditation or even in the contemplation or later in the day when some, somebody says something or something you see or something come forward, be vigilant. Be vigilant. That, and, the, and then when you get that impression, act, use the will and use visualization to act on it. And then there'll be the manifestation. Yes. And you'll get the Thank full you. lesson when you've helped someone in service through that very same matter. But that's, that's the process. Yes, sir. Thank you. I think what we'll do now is we'll cover some questions. I think we'll ask uh, Karen to mute us all now. We'll have our, our final closing exercise. I thank you so much for joining us and being, being with us. It's great, great learning with you and uh, sensing your presence and understanding is so great. Thank you. No problem. Okay, just take a, take a moment to uh, take a few deep breaths and we'll do this for about five minutes. We'll close uh, around half past hour. And I'm going to show a particular work of art to you, again by Caspar David Friedrich. And it's often entitled Woman Before the Rising Sun. Some also think Woman Before the Setting Sun. It's from about 1818. It's an oil on canvas. You just take some time to look at it and contemplate this work. And way I think you'll find that the light builds. You may wish to at some point turn inward in meditation or just remain entirely in contemplation. It's your choice. <laughs> 